Bibles to John chapter 17. We're going to read only a part of, of this passage, but the chapter 17 is Jesus' final prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane before his arrest, before going to the cross. And, um, and in this passage, the whole of John chapter 17, Jesus, it's called the, his high priestly prayer because he's praying for his disciples and he's praying for uh, you and me, for the church, down through the ages. But he is also giving an account of the three years of his mission and ministry to his father. And, um, and it's a final account on the status of his mission, that he has completed his mission, he is ready for the cross, he's going to be returning to uh, the Father in, in heaven, and, uh, and, and as we read the scripture, you're going to see, you're going to sense that, that he has said, I'm done training with these disciples. I finished their education, their discipleship. I've given them their, your word, and, uh, and then he prays for them. So let's look just at a portion of this, starting in verse 13. Jesus says, I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them, that is his disciples, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them. For they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself that they too may be truly sanctified. So Jesus, in this portion of his prayer, is noticing, is, is basically acknowledging he's going to be returning to his father. And, and he says, I have given um, those that you have given me out of the world, I've given them your word. And I pray, Lord, that, that you would protect them as I leave them in the world. And um, um, it's in this passage that we get the phrase that we often say as Christians, and, and uh, you know, how many people have heard this phrase, that we are called to be in the world, but not of the world? How many people have heard that phrase? And we go, yeah, we're in the world, but we're not of the world. Where did that come from? Well, it came right out of Jesus' prayer. He says, they're not of the world any more than I am of the world. But Lord, keep them in the world. The stuff in this world is messy. Wouldn't you agree? Life can be so messy. Someone who once said, you know, it would be great to, you know, be in the church if it weren't for the people. <laughs> not this church. You guys are great. But, you know, you know, it would be great to be a part of my family if it weren't for all the people in my family. It would be great to work in the job I'm working in if it weren't for all the people that came around this job. You know, we always look at that and we say, life is messy, relationships are messy, issues happen. Um, you know, when you think you're having, things are going really well, be careful because the refrigerator is going to break and this is going to happen. And, and we know that life is messy that way. And somehow we think that once we become a Christian, we're going to leave the messiness behind. No, God cleans up the messiness on the inside, but the messiness all around us oftentimes still exists. So how do we stay in the world how do we stay engaged with the messiness of the world around us, with the sin that we see in other people's lives, with the, with the issues that people have that oftentimes affect us? How do we stay engaged in the world and yet not be affected by it so that we become unclean with the stuff of the world? That's the issue. 
when we talk about that phrase being in the world but not of the world, that's really what comes down to. We are not of this world. Now, I remember years ago when we were in Connecticut, uh, you know, uh, another life ago, it seems, there, there were friends we had who said, we only want to engage with Christians. We don't want any non-Christians in our lives. And, uh, and they said, you know, we, we want our son to play with your daughter, but no one in our neighborhood. And we thought about that and said, wait a second. It doesn't work because we're called to be in the world, and how can we reach people in the world with the good news of Jesus Christ if we're not going to relate to them? And what they were looking at is saying, we don't want our life to be messy. We want to preserve our sanity and our sanctity and our holiness as Christians, so we're only going to relate to Christians. But that's not what Jesus wants of us. He did say, we are not of this world. That's true. Well, let's define world. What does world mean? The Bible looks at world three different ways. There's the physical world that God created, the mountains, the trees, the streams, the, you know, the birds, the animals, you know, all the beauty of the world around us. You know, that's one way, cosmo. Second way, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. What's the world in that context of John 3.16? People. So the Bible sometimes talks about the world as being the people of the world. Um, you know, all the people that God created in his image. And then there's a third way, uh, which oftentimes we talk about worldliness. We talk about, you know, not being of this world. Um, we talk about, you know, things related to that. That meaning of the world is really the fallen culture around us. It's the systems and the structures that have been affected by sin, that are ruled by Satan. And when we talk about worldliness and not being of the world, what we're saying is that we're not of that order. We're not, you know, we are not to be caught up in all the junk that we see, whether it's on Facebook or the tweets that we get on Twitter <laughs> or wherever it comes from, you know, the stuff of the front page of the newspaper. Oh, and, and we recognize that, um, that there is uh, a, a, a world system that is opposed to Jesus. We're not of this world. We're of the Lord. We're of his kingdom. We are agents of his kingdom. And there's a difference between the kingdom of God and the world, the world system. Two different perspectives, two different mindsets, two different worldviews, if you will. We know the worldview of the world around us because we grow up in it. You know, dog eat dog and looking out for yourself and he who dies with the most toys wins and all that type of stuff. We know all the bumper stickers. But there's a reality called the kingdom of God. It's different. That's what we are of. The kingdom of God came as Jesus entered the world and he began to minister and call people out to himself. And they shared the good news, the gospel of the kingdom. It wasn't just a gospel of salvation. What is the kingdom? It's the new order of God breaking into this fallen order. It's God saying, I'm going to come and I'm going to clean up the mess, first of all, within the hearts of people, in the minds of people, renewing our thinking. And God says, uh, it's my kingdom that comes, that affects relationships, and people begin to relate to one another in a way that is healthy. It begins to affect the things around us as we see justice as we see restoration of families. You know, someone says the, the kingdom of God, the good news of the kingdom is like a, a country music song played backwards, you know. Uh, instead of losing your job and losing your girl and everything else, it goes the other way. God is able to restore lives when Jesus comes. And that is the order that we are of. It's opposed to, to the world. The kingdom of God is rooted in love. The kingdom of this world is rooted in hatred. 
The kingdom of God is ruled by Jesus Christ. The kingdom of this world is ruled by, by Satan, the arch enemy of God. The kingdom of God says mercy triumphs over judgment. The world around us says revenge. We need to go for revenge. You see, there's a, there's a huge difference between those. And we are not of this world. The Bible says, Jesus said, sanctify them by the truth. And he says, Lord, your word is truth. And, you know, Ed's message last week, if you didn't get a chance to hear it, go online, listen to it, talks about the truth of God's word and how God's word can change us on the inside. That word sanctify, big 25-cent word, it just simply means to be made right. To be put in order. To be made holy. You know, oh, wait a second, I can't be holy. I've done too many things wrong. That's not what God's talking about. But he's talking about the order of the kingdom coming inside of your lives, in your thinking, so that you begin to respond out of who God is, not what the circumstances around you are. And oftentimes we respond to circumstances rather than respond out of the Spirit of God in us. You see, when God begins to heal on the inside, it brings life. And it brings light. It ena enables us to love. It enables us to show mercy. It enables us to walk in the Spirit of God and to represent and reflect that to the world around us because we're not of this world. We've been sanctified by God's word. The Bible says that we are born again, right? John chapter 3, Nicodemus comes to Jesus and says, how do I enter your kingdom? Jesus says you've got to be born again, born of the spirit, born from above. He says, how can I do that? I can't go back into my mother's womb. He says, Nicodemus, you're thinking about it wrong. I'm not talking about natural birth. I'm not talking about going back and trying to get another go at it, start again. Can't do that. Can't put toothpaste back into the tube, right? But he's saying, no, what happens if God, by his grace, comes inside of you, changes you on the inside, brings his order, renews your spirit, reconnects you with the Father so that now you have a different motivation within you that you're living by. That's what it means to be born again. We are not of this world because we've been born by the Spirit of God on the inside. We've been born from above. And we don't fit in this world. I remember when I first got saved, I didn't know anything. All I knew is that I needed to have something fixed on the inside of me. And when I gave my life to Jesus, there was a peace. There was something that came. I couldn't explain it. I, I just, you know, I, I knew that there was a change. And all of a sudden, I didn't fit in the world around me. I was in a fraternity. I was living in a fraternity house. Talk about awkward. You know, I didn't fit anymore. I wanted to hang around the, my new Christian friends and read the Bible, and people are looking at me and say, what happened to him? I'm not of this world. And when we try to relate to the world around us as Christians, does it work well? <laughs> no. Because we don't fit. We've been born again and brought into a different kingdom. That's what Jesus is saying here. We've been bought with a price. We don't belong to ourselves. Now, we're watching the Red Sox, you know, and postseason play and all this type of stuff. And I remember probably about, what, 10, 12 years ago when Pedro Martinez was pitching. It could be longer than that. Um, but he had one game where I think they were playing the Yankees, and um, – and, and they just basically destroyed him, you know. He just had a bad outing as a pitcher. And, uh, and he said something about, you know, they're my daddy. <laughs> and he got beat up with that. I don't know if you remember that. But, but that saying, who's your daddy? You know, in other words, who, who owns you? And, and I'm thinking, we need to ask ourselves that question in the world. Who is your daddy? Who is our father? 
The father of the world is Satan. The father of the kingdom is God Almighty. And when we begin to identify who our daddy is, that we are owned by the Lord, that we belong to him, that, that love has rescued us, it, every single chain has been broken. We are no longer slaves to fear. That when we acknowledge that, then we're able to see the difference of what it means to be in the world, but we're certainly not of the world. And then we can respond to our father and say, I do this because I know who my daddy is. Amen? So we're not of this world. But Jesus says we are to be in the world. In fact, he said, Father, as you've sent me into the world, so I am sending them into the world. Now we can look around, and, and I don't know about you, but there are times where, um, you know, I, I kind of didn't like the fact that Jesus said to the Father, don't take him out of this world. You know, because there are times where like, me, me up, Scotty. <laughs> Get me out of here. You know, we, it, it's messy living with in the context of our family relationships, our community. Um, you know, there was a town meeting uh, earlier this week, and, and we recognized that there were huge issues that people were passionate about. And, and we look at that, and we go, life is messy. God, wouldn't it be so great if you could just take me up into perfection and I never have to worry again? And we go, dang, Jesus prayed, Lord, keep them in the world. <laughs> he says, I'm not praying that you take them out of the world. They're not of the world. They don't belong there. But, Lord, I am sending them there because there is a mission of redemption that needs to be done. And so we are called to be in the world. We can't leave the mess behind. And I really believe the key for us because it's so easy as Christians to get mad at people who don't know the Lord because they're acting in a way that is so unchristian. Did anyone ever get mad at people who don't act that way? <laughs> yeah, we do. Why do we expect that non-Christians, people who don't know the love of Christ, are going to act in a, in a God-honoring way. Why do we expect that? We shouldn't. And we shouldn't be offended when they are caught in their sin, but we should be moved with compassion to pray that the bonds, that the, that the, the chains of bondage over their lives would be broken. And God, how do you want to use me to help them open their eyes? I think it was uh, Richard Tyndale back in the 11th or 12th century, uh, he was being um, um, burned at the stake, I believe. Catch, am I right? Was it Wycliffe? It was Wycliffe. He was being burned at the stake because he translated the Bible into English. And, um, and as he was burned, being burned at the stake, he said, Lord, open the eyes of the king of England. My goodness. Because he understood I'm not of this world. There's a kingdom that's greater than this world. I'm not of this world, but I've been sent in the world with a message of redemption. Lord, open their eyes. They don't know what they're doing. And we got people all around us who need that. We need to understand that Jesus has sent us into the world. And we experience all the trials and pressures of life just like everybody else. We enter into the mess of all the temptations. You know, what does it like, look like to live in the world? It looks like paying your mortgage on time and struggling to find the money to do that. It looks like um, dealing with relationships and asking forgiveness and giving forgiveness. It looks like going to work every single day and seeking to be faithful. We are living in the world. It looks like um, raising kids in the midst of the culture that we live in. It looks like dealing with how do we handle office gossip or neighborhood gossip. What is, how do we respond to that? That's living in the world. 
We're going to have it all. The only difference is we are the king. We belong to the Lord. We're going to respond differently. And when we respond differently, people notice the difference. They may not know why, but they notice the difference. There's a different reality that affects our thinking. And so instead of seeking revenge, we show mercy. Instead of promoting ourselves, we serve others. When you read through the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapters 5 through 7, Jesus is articulating the reality of the kingdom. That's what it looks like to live in a messy world. When someone demands something of you, give them extra. You know, we don't just love our friends, we love our enemies. That's challenging. But I'll tell you what, it's going to get the attention of people. Our response needs to be a kingdom response. We are sent in the world because we know the answers to life's problems. We can enter the messiness and brokenness of our world with the reality of the kingdom that is changing the way we think, changing the way we live. And when we do that, we can stay clean. We don't have to be affected by the sin around us. But we can go shoulder to shoulder, eyeball to eyeball, belly to belly like Jesus did. Jesus was, uh, he was vilified by being a friend of sinners. Right? Jesus showed up at the parties, but he was righteous. That's what God calls us. We are not of the world, but we are in the world. And we are sent in the world to represent the good news of God's kingdom. And there's three ways that we represent it. We represent it by our character, our motivation on the inside, the things that we choose as values. Those things represent the kingdom. We represent the kingdom of God by our words. We get to proclaim where our hope is and who Jesus is and why we do what we do. And we get to represent the kingdom of God in the world that we live by our actions. When we choose to act counterculturally and we choose to love rather than to hate, to show mercy and compassion rather than judgment, to, uh, to give rather than get, when we walk in the values of the kingdom, people around us, they're going to they're gonna say, why are you doing this? This is unnatural. You said, yeah, it's unnatural to the world, but it's natural to the kingdom. Let me introduce you to the king. He can change your life. He can give you peace. He can give you hope. We are not of this world. Don't try to be. We're of the Lord, but we are in the world. We have been bought with the price of Jesus' life upon the cross we don't belong to ourselves. We don't belong to the world around us. We belong to Jesus. We are called, we are sent to live in this world right now for the short time that we're here in comparison to eternity as representatives of God's kingdom. It is messy. It is meant to be messy. Sin is messy. Unholiness is messy. The world around us is messy. Lives are broken, and they're getting worse and worse in our culture, which means that the gospel of Jesus is going to shine brighter and brighter, and that we have a hope that the world needs, and we can't keep it to ourselves. Will we live in this broken and messy world according to our way? or according to God's way? Will you see yourself this week as being in the world, but not of it? Messy, but clean. God, give us grace that we might do that. Let's pray together. Father, thank you 
that you sent Jesus. He entered our world. He entered into reality of the mess all around us. And he came for the purpose of redeeming, paying the price, giving his life, that we might know the restoration of our own lives on the inside. And that restoration can work from us out, touching relationships, touching workplaces, touching families. Lord, remind us this week that we do not belong in the context of the fallen world around us, but we're called to relate to those in it as representatives of your kingdom. Show us, Lord, how you want us to live. Show us, Lord, those that we are called to reach out to, to befriend. Give us your grace, Lord, that we can forgive when they act uh, as someone who's a part of this fallen world. Lord, we thank you that we can turn to you and we thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit in us. The power of your resurrection life in us. That is going to change those around us. We ask you for your grace now. In Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me? Um, I just want to close with reading from Colossians chapter 3. And um, 